Well, it's been wonderful to uh, be with you these couple of days. I have, uh, I've had a marvelous time and uh, really have been stimulated by the challenge of thinking about some of these very important issues about following Christ in a multi-faith world. I told you at the beginning that I was basing my talks loosely on uh, 1 Peter 3. In the last part, the last two verses in that passage go like this, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And then in the end, the most important thing is the, the challenge to point people to Jesus Christ, whose name is the, the name above every name, and the only name under heaven through whom we can find salvation. But how do we point people to Jesus in a multi-faith world? And I've got uh, about five things I want to say. Um, and the first is this. There's no one size fits all to doing it. You know, we really need to take seriously the specifics of a, of a worldview, of a religious perspective, taking each perspective on its own terms, which means that we have to listen before we speak. I had the privilege two summers ago to um, be a part of a group co-sponsored by Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and uh, Tokyo Christian University, a group that gathered in, uh, in, in Tokyo and in Japan uh, to talk about how we present the, the suffering of Christ, the suffering Savior, to people of various religious worldviews and perspectives. And one of the simple points that I took away from that that I think it's important to share with you this morning is this, that, that we present the suffering Christ in different ways to the Buddhist and to the Muslim. You know, if we think of the, the two key elements of the gospel at the very heart of it, that there is a sovereign God who through his marvelous grace has sent the Son into the world so that he might suffer on our behalf on the cross of Calvary and indeed throughout his life, but especially on the cross of Calvary. That if we go to Islam, uh, the Muslim has a sovereign God, but not a suffering Savior. And if we go to the Buddhist, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on suffering, but not on a sovereign God. And so our approach in each case is going to be a different one. We need to say to the Buddhists that, uh, that suffering ultimately only makes sense in the context of the worship of the God and Father of Jesus Christ. And we need to say to the, to the Muslim that that sovereign God has entered into our condition and taken our sin and our guilt upon himself in Jesus. So the study of other religions, which I think has intrinsic value. It's just a good thing to understand things, but it's also very important for our witness in the world. I've, showed a, show, I've quoted John Calvin the last two talks, and now I'll get to the one who's really my favorite theologian, the great Abraham Kuyper, the 19th century theologian who was also a statesman. He was the prime minister of the Netherlands for a while. And we've been discovering in some of the recent writings that have been translated into English of, of Kuiper that he was surprisingly fascinated with Islam. And there were two things about Islam in particular that he, uh, he was fascinated by. The one is that, uh, that the Calvinist and the Muslim both believe in a sovereign God who is holy other in the technical terms, the totalitaire alater, the, the God who is the holy other, the creator of all things. And they honored that sovereign God, secondly, by seeing that God as wanting to, wanting human beings to do his will in all areas of life. Many of you will know that one of the great proclamations of Abraham Kuyper is this one, that there is not one square inch of the entire creation about which Jesus Christ 
who is Lord of all, does not cry out, this belongs to me. And the Muslim, too, believes that uh, Allah is the Lord over the whole creation, but, but it's so important that, that we speak to the Muslim about the one who entered into that creation, who suffered out there on those square inches of, of creation so that we might be called into a community who is called to show forth his sovereign rule over all of life through the blood and the mercies of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And so taking particularities into account, I, I, I once agreed to be on a panel on peacemaking with the, I keep having these things that sound like bad jokes, but with a Jew, a Muslim, a Hindu, and a Buddhist. <laughs> and uh, we had to talk about how we understand peacemaking within our own uh, perspective. And I went first, and I talked about Isaiah and, and swords being beaten into plowshares, et cetera, et cetera. And then I talked about how Jesus Christ is the one who came as the, the Prince of Peace. And a rabbi went next and he said, well, forget about the last part about Jesus, but everything else, he was given the Jewish perspective as well. And then the imam, the Muslim imam said, uh, you know, I kind of agree with the, with the Jew and the Christian basically on the whole idea of peacemaking. And then the Buddhist spoke and then the Hindu woman uh, said something that really struck me. She said, you know, there's a division here that's really three versus two, because the Christian and the Jew and the Muslim believe that the fundamental problem of the human condition is disobedience. And they believe that the solution is being brought into a life of obedience to the divine. But she said, the Buddhist and I, we believe that the fundamental issue of the Christian life is ignorance and that the solution is enlightenment. Well, that was a very, I thought, a very telling statement. And that means that as we're talking to our Jewish and our Muslim friends, we're probably going to try to uh, set up the conversation in such a way that we think about, we talk about different things, things about the human condition. What is the fundamental problem of the human condition? And we will be beginning at very different points than we might in a conversation with a Buddhist or a Hindu. So no generic approach. And secondly, build trust. It's so important. I was mentioning to some folks yesterday that about 10 years ago, I was approached by a rabbi from the Southern California Rabbinic Council who said, you know, we'd really like to have some uh, dialogue with evangelicals. We've done a lot with liberal Protestants. We've done a lot with Catholics, but we're, we're, we think we're ready for evangelicals. And so we arranged a setup where students and faculty and local pastors, evangelical pastors, many of them graduates of Fuller, got together twice a year with, uh, with rabbis, and we would serve kosher food uh, on the campus that day. And uh, the, the first time we ever met, we put the Isaiah social justice text on the table, and they were all sitting around tables, five or six people on a table. And we posed the question that they talked about for about 45 minutes, have you ever gotten in trouble for preaching this stuff? And it was interesting how the rabbis and the pastors engaged each other on this because they had some very common challenges in talking about the issues of justice with their congregations. The next time we had a rabbi and a fuller professor talk about the book of Job and what does that mean when, you're, when you've got a couple in your church whose child has just been hit by a car and killed and, and they're angry with God and, and that was a wonderful thing. Then we got together a, a, an evangelical screenwriter who wrote for uh, uh, Home Improvement, which was the, uh, for three years in a row, the leading situation comedy. And he talked about how there was a lot of Christianity in, in that. Uh, he talked about covenantal fidelity, uh, couples staying together, being good neighbors. And the, 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 the Orthodox Jew was the screenwriter for uh, a program, many of you will know, the, the New Adventures of the Old Christine. And he talked about some of the challenges he had as an Orthodox Jew in dealing with issues of uh, jokes about sexuality and the like in, in that program. And it turned out that he could not even watch the show when it was aired because it was on Friday evening and, uh, and he was observing the Shabbat uh, already. But it was a fascinating thing. And 
Two years ago, we got together for a couple sessions and talked about Israel and Palestine. And just last year, the rabbi, my rabbi counterpart, said to me, I think we're ready to talk about Jesus. And we had built that trust, and it's so important to build that trust and to engage in hospitality. And then thirdly, to stand alongside of others. Uh, I was, when I was living in Michigan on a cold winter day, not quite as bad as you've had it recently here, uh, during the Christmas season, I was in a Sears store walking through a very crowded store, casting my eyes to and fro to try to figure out what to get people for Christmas totally oblivious to the Muzak system that was blaring out Christmas carols. But suddenly I was arrested. I was stopped in my tracks by a profound theological lesson from Perry Como. He's saying, little town of Bethlehem, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in the night. And I looked around the store. What are the hopes and fears? of the woman who tries out a dress and, and it's, not, uh, it's a little too tight because she's been eating too much Christmas stuff lately, or the other woman who seems so happy, but she's actually afraid her husband's going to come home from the office Christmas party drunk and abuse her as he did the year before. The little kid look at longing, longing leaf on a bicycle. Uh, Jesus doesn't come with diet plans. He doesn't come with automatic solutions to abusive relationships. He doesn't come bringing bicycles. But, but the underlying hopes and fears, the, the things that drive people in all of those kinds of cases are, I want to be loved. I want to be accepted. I want to feel safe. And it's so important for us to be exegeting those hopes and fears. Uh, we saw it this morning with Safiya's wonderful dance that 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 story was a, a story about hopes and fears. And uh, it's so important for us to study the Hindu story so that we can find ways to talk about people uh, to Jesus Christ. And it's an act of providence that I had here a long quotation from uh, 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 actually the, the, a long paragraph that I read back when I was a seminary student that's one of the most influential paragraphs I've ever read. And it's by uh, Bishop Stephen Neal, who was uh, one of the founding bishops of the Church of South India, in a wonderful book called Christian Faith and Other Faiths, The Christian Dialogue and Other Religions. And this is what he said right around 1950. He said, the Christian must not be surprised if between now and the end of this century, the Christian witness in India becomes more difficult than it has been for a century. The Christian must be prepared to face the possibility, and this is where it gets profound, I think, that the greater part of our work must be from within Hinduism in putting questions to the Hindu and helping the Hindu understand himself better. All the time, the Christian will be attempting to help the Hindu to see the radical unsatisfactoriness of all the answers that have been given to his questions, and so to point him to the one in whom those questions can receive their all-sufficient answer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Pointing people to Jesus, recognizing that, that wonderful insight of St. Augustine at the, at the beginning, the prayer that he utters at the beginning of his confessions, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. And, and there's a restlessness, a spiritual restlessness in Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam in unbelief, that we need to exegete those hopes and fears, posing questions from within a person's perspective, helping that person to understand his or her uh, basic fundamental concerns better, all the while looking for the opportunity with gentleness and reverence to point them to the all-sufficient one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to say here, too, that uh, at the end of what I've been discussing about following Christ in a multi-faith world, that we do need to want to point people to Jesus. Uh, this is a long story, and I won't give the long version of it, but a, a young man who went to seminary as, uh, out of the civil rights movement, and he vowed that uh, when he went into a church, he was going to take an all-white church, 
And for five years, he was not going to say anything about race, because when he finally spoke to that white racist congregation about racial justice, he wanted them to hear not the words of an arrogant graduate of a seminary, but as a faithful pastor who had shown them the love of Jesus Christ. And it just so happened that after three years, a group of African-Americans walked into the church one morning, it was Communion Sunday, and uh, they went to uh, sit in the front row, and the deacons came and asked them to leave. And at that point, the young man, already up on the pulpit, went down and grabbed the, the goblet of wine and the bread, and he ran down to those African-Americans, and he said, the body of Jesus Christ is broken for you. The blood of Jesus Christ is shed for you. And he was fired. But as he reflected back on that, he said, up to that point, my silence about racial justice was the silence of obedience. But if I had remained silent at that moment, my silence would have become the silence of, of, of disobedience. And it's so important for us to wait on the Lord. But in order to wait on the Lord, to be sure that we're not engaged in not mentioning Jesus because we don't want to mention Jesus, that we need to nurture that deep personal faith in Jesus Christ. A couple decades ago, I was invited to be a part of a panel at a state university, and the topic of the day was the past, present, and future <clears throat> of religious movements in America. Another one of the bad jokes. They had a, a rabbi, they had a priest, Catholic priest, they had a liberal Protestant in me. They, these days they would have a, an, an imam as well. And it was a full day on this campus, and a large crowd came. And in the morning, we each talked about the past, the evangelical past. I went back to Puritanism and talked about how evangelical themes had shaped much of, uh, of American life at the beginning. Talked about the role of Judaism, talked about the role of Catholicism. And, uh, and then, uh, and, and mainline Protestantism. And then in the afternoon, we talked about the present. Late in the afternoon, we talked about the future, our future hopes. And then in the evening, we had a panel discussion. And when we finally threw it open to the audience, a young man stood up and said, I got a question for Dr. Mao. You know, I, I really didn't know much about evangelicalism, but uh, you've taught me a lot today. But I have one more question. What is it that you believe that the other three people on the platform do not believe? One of my friends, George Marsden, the historian, says whenever Mao gets into a corner, he quotes uh, a hymn, and that's what I did that day. Uh, just the week before in our home church, the, the final hymn of the worship service was, uh, It is well with my soul. And there's that wonderful verse. It goes like this. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It is well with my soul. And I said, you know, uh, the rabbi is not going to sing that. He's not going to sing that uh, through the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, I can say here and now, it is forevermore well with my soul. The Catholic priest, and here I hedged a bit, if he's into the kind of thing Catholics were saying at the time of the Reformation, I, and I was glad I put it that way because afterward he came up to me and he said, I love that song. I can sing that song as well. And I thank God for what the Lord has been doing in bringing us together, evangelicals and Catholics, in so many ways. And I said, the, uh, because in the time of the Reformation, uh, we had a Reformation precisely because we felt that the existing church at the time of the Reformation was not providing people with the spiritual assurance that here and now, through the once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, people can say it is forevermore well with my soul. And the liberal Protestant had said earlier in the day, he didn't believe in all that, uh, and he quoted Harry Emerson Fosdick, the great liberal of the early 20th century, in that slaughterhouse religion stuff. Yeah. He wanted the forgiveness and the love of Jesus without the the saving, atoning work in that deep sense of, of the atonement. So I said, uh, that's what I believe that no one else on the, on the platform 
can sing out of their tradition that through the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we can say it is forevermore well with my soul. Now, it's so important when we say that among ourselves to to keep going, though, because the God who says to each of you this morning, because of Jesus Christ, it is forevermore well with your soul is a God who looks at the creation and says, but it is not well with the creation. It's not well with polluted streams. It's not well with marriages in the Chicago suburbs. It's not well in Pyongyang, North Korea. It's not well in the relationships in, uh, in, in places in Africa for, for uh, AIDS, orphan, uh, AIDS orphans. Uh, it's not well among Hindus today, certainly not well for little girls in India and other places in Asia who are being sold into sexual slavery. It is not well with God's creation. And the God who says to each of us in our individual hearts, it is well with you because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, wants you to be working for that day when Jesus Christ will return and he will proclaim all things are made new, and we need to be faithful as we prepare for that day. I have to say that, but I also have to say that that individual relationship with Jesus Christ is really the foundation of it. It's only because we know Jesus. It's only because we know what it means to have our sins forgiven through his atoning work that we can enter in confidence embracing the mysteries, engaging in the challenges, being willing to live with some of the questions that we don't know how to answer, but that we can stand alongside of people of other religious traditions and people of no religious tradition at all and exegete their hopes and fears and look for the opportunity to point them to the one in whom the all sufficient answers are given namely the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope it's well with your soul this morning, because if it's not well with your soul, it's going to be pretty hard to work for the day when it will be well with the whole creation. That wonderful scene that we had read to us earlier, when a multitude that no human being can number stand before the throne and sing the song of victory to the Lamb and the Lord God is telling us to engage in the kind of encounters, the kind of in, uh, dialogues, the kind of evangelistic efforts that will bring people alongside of us on, on that great day. Let's conclude by just singing that one verse together a cappella. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. O my soul, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious song. My sin, not in heart, but is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. It is as you engage in the wonderful journey of following Jesus in a multi-faith world. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And all God's people say, Amen. <laughs>